So, um, by popular demand, we're going to switch now to landscape. And um, I must say that uh, this is an amusing um, subject, and it's it's particularly nice because. Um, you can learn some real physics about renormalization and the renormalization group by just playing around with Monte Carlos. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we're going to do. Um, that was um, Wilson's approach to renormalization. And uh, he did win a Nobel Prize for it and related matter. Um, Let's see what to start with. I think I'll start with um, using this impossible to erase Mexican chalk, which nonetheless makes a very good image. Um, the problem is I have to hide it to the other people who use it. Um, so let me remind you uh, about gauge theory. Um, the basic thing we want is that we want d prime mu psi prime to be g d mu psi. Um, where here the understanding is that this is d mu prime g psi. That is to say, we're talking about a rule. <laughs> it's built in obsolescence. They learned it from GM. Okay, so this is a local symmetry. A local symmetry is where the psi, I'm thinking of it as a vector, typically, and G is a matrix in some gauge group. X is the space time point. If the Lagrange density is invariant under this, then we have a local gauge uh, theory. Um, now, it's, uh, it's easy to have some parts of Lagrange density invariant under this, but it's harder to have derivatives invariant because then the derivative acts on G as well as psi, and that screws things up. The, Traditional solution is you introduce a covariant derivative and you say that you want d prime psi to transform, that is to say, d mu psi prime equal to this, to transform like this the same way that psi transforms. Psi transforms with a g, so d mu psi has to transform with a g. Well, in that case, we just look at these two equations, and what we see is that g d mu should be d mu prime g, or that d mu prime should be d d mu uh, g inverse. Is there a prime on that side in the second equality? Or third No, oh, let's think. No, this this one, it's this. Psi prime is G psi. Right. So this is kosher. So I mean the one in the middle. No. The idea here is that D mu psi, just as psi prime is G psi, so to D mu psi prime is g d mu psi. That's the idea. And that gives us this. And then we can say, well, d mu is going to be the ordinary derivative times the identity matrix plus some other matrix a mu. And then this rule here says then that uh, d mu i plus a mu prime, which is d mu prime. We're going to go through a lot of chalk today. 
um, is equal to g d mu, which is d mu i plus a mu g inverse. And now, let me just um, clear up something here that undoubtedly is going to bother people. Um, actually, it still bothers me a little bit, even though I've figured it out about a hundred times. This derivative here acts on g inverse, but it's also, it also acts to the right. So this is equal to g d mu g inverse plus, if the derivative doesn't act on g mu, then g g mu just gives you 1. So it's also d mu times the identity, we're down to stubs now, plus g a mu g inverse. Okay? So that's the full expansion. Now we cancel this with this, and we have the a mu prime is equal to g a mu g inverse plus uh, g d mu g inverse. Oh, this is disappearing. All right. So this is our basic question. Um, I'm not totally sure of that same term. Yeah, I remember a handy. Questions. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't really follow. The you. next question gets a Reese buttercup. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have one later, so thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, so, is, it, is this arising from some kind of like chain rule or product rule? Well, the derivative here acts on G inverse. Yeah, and and uh, but it also That's acts the first term. Right. in the sense that this I'm looking at d mu oh, as an operator. I got it. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay. Okay. So this is our rule here. Now let me mention. Let me just try to write it a little better. Boy, this. Anyway, so what we have here then is a mu prime is g a mu g inverse plus uh, g d mu g inverse. And let me just mention something. The identity <laughs> This is absurd. The identity is g g inverse. And the derivative of the identity is zero. So this says d mu g g inverse plus g d mu g inverse is zero. Okay? So you can swap this thing. You can say it's the same thing as g a mu g inverse minus d mu g g inverse. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, um, now let me switch to something that is I don't know how to say it. Let me just say that when I was first shown this on a blackboard, I think it was Sidney Coleman who was doing it, I was very impressed. Okay. This? No, this is not floor about it. This is just the, the basic stuff. But what I'm about to show you now is, I mean, it's still basic stuff. It's still the elementary gauge theory. But it's got, there's a sort of magic to this next thing that I've, I've always found somewhat interesting. OK, x1 and x2 are space-time points. P is a path. This is then a path-ordered exponential. Path ordered exponential x1 to x2, a mu of x dx mu. Okay? So this, this is something that's quite 
nice, and it plays a big role in lattice gauge theory more than in ordinary gauge theory. But it sh could be that we should that should play a bigger role. Yeah. Uh, could you remind us what a pathwork exponential is? Oh, great. Um, yeah, you got to keep on your toes here. You could lose an eye on one of these chocolates. Um, by path order, what I mean, and in fact, it, it's, it, there are two senses where I have to explain that. Clearly, what it means is that it's a product of many exponentials along the path. But the question is, which way does the path grow, go? And when I was first working this out over the weekend, I assumed that the path was going this way. And I couldn't get it to work out. The path has to go this way if this is the formula. At least that's the way, the way I made it to work. So in other words, uh, to get back to, I'm getting to your question now. In other words, uh, part of this thing is, let me get it right now. Yes. E to the A of X. Let me write it as e to the a of x dx, and you understand that there's a mu that we're assigning over. Okay? It'll just be clearer if I write it this way. e to the x plus dx dx, and then so forth. e to the x plus 2 dx. Actually, it's in a certain sense, it's not 2 dx, it's really dx plus dx prime, and then this would be dx prime, okay? So in other words, it's path ordered where the very first one is e to the a of x1 mu dx mu, and then the last one here is e to the a mu of x2 dx mu. Should, uh, so that's what it looks like. Should that also be x1 and that should also be x2 maybe? No. Where? Oh, this is it. x1. We're going from x1 to x2. Yeah, never mind, never mind. Yeah, yeah. You still get a trunk. Is it really the limit of this thing? It's something small? What? Is it really the limit of this? Is something goes to zero? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking about dx mu infinitesimal long path. Um, so this, um, this is, this is this path ordered exponential. A, of course, is a matrix, so the path ordering means something. And in, um, if we're doing this so that that's an operator, we might also have time ordering. Okay. So this now gets strange because you have the, the operator components time ordered and the matrices path ordered. Uh, because after all, what we're thinking of here is a mu of x is a mu a of x t a, where t a are the generators of the gauge group. All right. So now let's look at what happens to this C under gauge transformation. So under gauge transformation, C prime, x1, x2, and p, well, what is it? Now it's the same product, but it looks like this. E to the A prime of x dx plus, no, not plus, times. <laughs> e to the a prime of x x plus dx dx dot 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 okay where the prime is this thing here okay And this prime, what does it look like? Well, it's dot, 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 e 
to the g of x a, and I'm, I, I can put in a subscript every now and then, g inverse of x plus um, g, g, in, g d mu g inverse. And then times e to the g of x plus dx a mu of x plus dx, the inverse of x. Whoops, there was a dx mu that I left out here. Let me put it in here. small and um, so I'm not going to worry about the commutator of these two guys because they're multiplied by dx right? um, any, and also I'm going to think about this as um, here, let me write, let me, let me just see here in my notes here what I've done. Um, all right, this is, this is effectively d log g, or actually it's minus that, isn't it? Yes. It's, in other words, if we want to rewrite it, we can rewrite it as minus um, d mu g, g inverse. And so this is minus d log g, d mu log g, dx mu. And so that means that that, that times dx mu is minus log of g of x plus dx plus log of g of x. And this is all up there in that exponential. So in other words, it's e to the g of x, a mu of x, g inverse of x, dx mu, and then this thing. In fact, I might as well just, since it happened to fall right in the exponential, I can have it here. Then the next one is e to the g of x plus dx, a mu of x plus dx, the inverse x plus dx, dx mu plus g of x plus dx, d mu the inverse x plus dx. So we're saying the reciprocal of g is g inverse? Hmm? We're saying 1 over g is the same as g inverse? Yeah, is that how you got to Yeah. Also, G is a scalar function. It's not a... No, no, no. It is a matrix, but um, G, G inverse is 1 over G. Well, that seems like an abuse of notation. I mean, for, for numbers, that might be true, but for some arbitrary group, there's no reason that... Well, this these are... Let's put it this way. The inverse. Yeah, but it's natural. What, what all right, let's put it this way. What is, what, what, what I do agree with 
is that G inverse and the derivative of G don't necessarily commute. And in fact, that's what we saw over here, <clears throat> that in fact they anti-commute. That's curious. Well, no, these, right, are, can't you know, these aren't the same two things. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right, let me just see what happens here. Um, okay. What? We can rewrite this then as, here's the way I'm going to rewrite it. Um, I'm going to say this is, I'm, I'm going to take this thing here and pull it down as g inverse of x plus dx. And then what I have left is log of g All right, I'm going to write it this way, g of x, like that. I thought this worked out. I'm a little puzzled here. Um, uh, well, let's do this part. This part I'm going to rewrite as g of x, e to the a mu of x, g inverse of x. Okay, that 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 more that does more or less work. Okay, so I'm going to write this thing here, e to the g a g inverse dx mu, as g e to the a mu of x dx g inverse of x. Okay, that part is completely right. That only work if you have a unitary representation of g. But it doesn't matter because g g and g inverse is the only thing that. In other words, you in other words, e to the g b g inverse is always g e to the b g inverse. This is this is automatically true. So I'm using that. Then the log g comes down as that, the, min the minus log of g of that comes down as that. And now I play the same trick over here. But what comes down now is g of x plus dx, e to the a mu of x plus dx, g, uh, and now it comes down as g inverse of x plus dx, and then it's going to be, uh, wait a minute, yes, and then it's going to be g of x plus dx plus dx prime, and then, wait, I, all right, it's going to be the same thing as this, but, yeah, I've got it backwards. And there's a g inverse. There it is. Okay, so it comes down like this, then the log term gives you this, and then there's the next term. The result is that all of these factors cancel. This with the next one and so forth. And the result is that this thing is equal to g of x, how did we do it, g of x1, C of x1, x2, and t, g inverse of x2. So in other words, the, the net result of the whole thing is just to multiply by the left, by g, g of x1 on the left, and by g inverse of x2 on the right. That's the result of the whole gauge transformation. This point the closed loop becomes interesting because you have the same. Yes, yes, time. yes. Brilliant. In fact, 
The point is then that if you have a closed loop and take the trace, it's invariant, it's gauge invariant. So in other words, the trace of, what do I want to say, C of x1, x1, P is gauge invariant. That is to say, trace of C prime of x1, or let's just say x, 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 P is equal to the trace of G of x, C of x, x, P, G inverse of x, which of course is trace of C of x, x, P, G inverse of x, G of x, which is just the trace of C of x, x, P. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's important, and, and it's something, it's something that you just pointed out, and in fact, it, it lies at the basis of this thing, uh, of lattice gauge theory, and in particular Wilson's formulation of it. Um, and notice that it's based on this, this very interesting thing, this, this path integral of this path ordered exponential of the connection from one point to another. All right, so now, now let's see what we can do with that. And all right, I guess the next thing to do is to is to leap right into Wilson's formulation. Um, the, the Wilson formulation then. is to divide, first of all, to divide, well, what do we want to do? Let me just say what we want to do. Remember that you can uh, express things in terms of ratios of path integrals, and in particular in Euclidean space, there are ratios of Euclidean path integrals. So it's basically that um, some sort of operator, A1, A2, is an integral e to the minus Euclidean action, uh, integrate over all the fields a1, a2, divided by integral e to the minus Euclidean action dA. So this is basically what we're doing, and this gives the Euclidean time ordered product. Okay? This, this is in um, chapter whatever, in this online, my online notes. And, okay, so now uh, the question is how to do this, and nobody knows how to do the integral exactly in general, or even in, I mean, except in, in the case where the, if the theory, if S is quadratic in the field, then yes, you can do it. If it's not quadratic, you can't do it. It's based, that's basically it. Reminds me a little bit of that story that uh, the humorist used to tell that the investing in the stock market it is simple. Um, uh, if a stock goes up, you buy it. If it doesn't go up, you don't buy it. Who is this? Oh, that, I forget. Uh, he was the most famous humorist of his time, but I can't remember, the early 20th century, 1920, 1930, 1940. Yeah, I mean, I, one reason I don't remember is that it was before my time also, but that was um, one of his jokes. Okay, so the idea of lattice gauge theory is to turn this from an impossible functional integral into a marginally possible high, uh, integral of high dimension. And so instead of integrating over A 
of x for every space point, space time point x, we put space time on a lattice and we just integrate over the vertices of the lattice. Or, and in fact that was the way people were doing lattice gauge theory before Wilson. Then Wilson said, well, because of gauge theories, let's focus not on the vertices of the lattice. So this is space time with a lattice spacing A. Okay. Instead of uh, focusing on the vertices of the lattice, let's um, also look at the links between the vertices. And so you have these little squares. And for some reason, I don't know what, I, I don't know the history of this, but for some reason these, these little squares were called, not little squares, but plaquettes, using the French word for little square. Um, how that happened, I don't know. It may be that there were some French people, who, probably some French people who introduced that. Anyway, um, one possibility is in your stand, but I, I really don't know how to do it. All right, so now notice, <clears throat> in fact, notice that we've got this thing that's gauge invariant. And in fact, let's look at, let, let's just think about what, what, uh, what this is if we integrate, in other words, if we have e to the integral a mu dx mu, and now we're integrating over a loop. Okay, so now it's gauge invariant. <coughs> All right, now this thing is gauge invariant, and it's gauge invariant. This is a trace of a path ordered exponential here, and it's gauge invariant no matter what the path is. Um, but if we consider the path to be just a little um, plaquette, then uh, what is it? Well, here, let us, let us think about this plaquette in the following way. We've got, we first go along here, and in fact I'm going to be doing it in a um, This is going to be um, E, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to change A to, I'm going to pull out an I and a coupling constant. So this is going to be I G0 A1. So this is going to be a plaquette in the 1, 2 direction. This is going to be the 1 direction. 1, and that's going to be the 2 direction. G0 is a coupling constant, not a... Yeah. Okay. In fact, the 0 means it's bare. In other words, it's the one that um, occurs in the Lagrangian, the, uh, the original Lagrangian, which then we substitute into the renormalized one plus the counter term. So it's going to look like this. And now I'm going to call x this, and I'm going to say, well, what is this? What is this? Uh, the gauge field here. The gauge field here is the gauge field in x minus e2 hat over, t let me just call it e2 hat so I don't have to do the, the one half explicitly. So this is going to be x minus e2 hat. Then it's going to be e to the i g0 a2 of x plus e1 hat. Okay? One, two. Now, however, it's going to be going backwards, and so the dx is negative. So that means, oh, and the dx, I forgot the dx, it's a little a. Okay. And, and so this one then is e to the minus i g0 a, a1 of now x plus e2 hat. And then finally, e to the minus i g0 a, a2 of x minus e1 hat. Okay. 
So it's the trace of this product. Okay. Now, if, if we're to imagine that the A is really super, super tiny, this is fine. Okay. And in fact, uh, what is it? Well, um, we can think, well, how can we think of it? We can think of it as um, all right, let me let me think of it in this way, which is um, let's just combine all the exponentials and we can uh, sort of do that in that um, in that uh, we're going to expand each one, one plus something, and yeah, then multiply all right, them all together, the, the, yeah, and then the, ignore the, all the higher order ones. Yeah, the, the, the best way to do this is, I, I mean, the way I've done it in the past is to expand everything. Um, and I'm just one. I'm thinking, though, of, of, of just doing it up, up top there, because you see, you can think of this. You can combine these two exponentials, and you can say it's e to the i g zero d. Um, it's actually minus d two a one times um, a. Okay, combining these two, and then combining these two, it's plus i g zero a d1 a2. So you see the, just the lowest order, you see the derivatives coming about. And then what you've got is the commutators. And um, you can think of it as this first term is minus uh, g0 squared a1 a2. And minus g zero. Well, there's an a squared. Minus g zero squared a squared uh, a one a two. But then you've got to take into account all the other ones. And um, so you've got these two, which is plus g zero squared a squared. A two, A one, and then I guess these. Well, I've done those two, haven't I? I did those two, but there is um, A two with A one, so plus G zero squared A squared A two A one, in as much as the trace is cyclic. Um, this is all on the exponent. Did Yeah, hey, what do you know? It works out. The normal way I've done this in the past is the way you suggested, namely expanding each of these. But this basically works. So this is the trace of E. And let me. All right, I copied this out of Kreutz, and I don't remember what Kreutz's convention after it, because it's always a. But I guess we can figure it out from what we've got. Um, his, okay, that's his. Right, his, is, his, I think, is the same as one verse. All right, so this is IG0A, and this is then D1A2 minus D2A1 from these two terms. And now, from these terms, we've got an extra factor. So we want, um, let's call it, let's, let's pull this one in. This is plus I G zero to get the minus sign. 
IG0 A um, A1, A2, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's right, right? Is there a factor of two? Or like a half? Yeah, I know. There is that factor of two there. Um, and I'm... I'm not sure what happened to the factor of two. Um, it may be that... All right, in any event, if... Let me say this. You do the arithmetic correctly, and you write um, f, you use f mu nu as d mu a nu minus d nu a mu plus, and um, here, let me, let, me use, let me just check this to have the right convention here. It is, it is, he has minus i g zero a mu a nu and ah oh, ah oh, ah oh. let's let's just the the thing with the derivatives. Um, You see, there's an A here, really. This is proportional, this is A over 2. Okay. So, um, there's an extra uh, A here. Oh. In fact, I, oh, I've got an A. It doesn't need to be inside. In fact, I, mean, I think there's an A squared here. No, yeah. So with the a squared, then we have that. All right. In any event, what we... It's also a factor. Yeah. Then they'll all have the same factor of a half, too. Good. So what we have is trace um, e to the i g0 a squared f12. And on the other hand, um, what is that? Well, that is the trace of 1 <coughs> plus i g0 a squared f12 minus g0 a, a to the fourth over 2 f12 squared and then higher order terms. Okay? Now, the key point, of course, is that we're talking about a um, typically SUN, and so the tr the trace the trace of TA is zero, so the trace of this is zero. Okay, the trace of that is n, where n is the dimension of the make of the generator. So this thing is equal to n from the first term minus g0 squared over 2, a to the fourth, f12, trace of f12, let me just say trace of f12 squared. Okay. All right, so what Wilson did was to make this the basic thing in the action, but then to add a constant and scale it so that it comes out right. In other words, the action of a plaquette is then, first of all, beta, an overall constant, 1 minus 1 over n, n is the dimension of the generators in this representation that we're talking about, real part of the trace of, and then 
U, I, J, U, J, K, U, K, L, U, L, I. That's, and where the U's are these, these exponentials on these successive links. And what happens then is that this is then, there's the 1 here and minus 1 over n, well the 1 over n gives you a, a 1, and then we get plus uh, g0 squared over 2n, uh, a to the fourth trace of f12 uh, squared. So the whole thing is beta g0 squared over 2n and um, beta g0 squared over 2n uh, beta g0 squared over 2n, a to the fourth trace of f12 squared. Let me just write it f12 squared. And now, if we, if we then go to, we, we can imagine then summing this over all possible plaquettes not just in the 1, 2 plane, but in the 1, 3 plane, and the 1, 4 plane, and the 2, 4 plane, so on and so forth, then what you wind up with is an approximation to beta g0 squared over 2n integral of a half trace of f mu nu, well, f mu nu squared, let us say, d4 x. And um, I forget what the one, extra one half comes from, but the, there's an extra one half there. And so the result is that you say that beta is 2n over g0 squared. So that gives you the, um, the action. Um, it's, I, 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 it could be that it's the normalization of the generators is, is one half. That is a, that's typically the way you normalize the generator. But it, um, in any event, that's, um, that's uh, Wilson's formulation of Einstein's gauge theory and what what it has, let, let me just mention the, the two really um, remarkable things about this. The first is that we got away then of approximating ratios of functional integrals that is really pretty much insensitive to the nonlinearities here. In other words, it allows a completely perturb non perturbative treatment of things. Remember in the past what we were doing was we would do the uh, free part exactly and then we'd expand the rest of it and it was effectively Feynman diagrams and um, even getting the loop correction to the, anomaly, to the magnetic moment of the electron was already a big deal. Okay, and that only was one loop. Whereas here, one is working to all loops. Okay, so, okay. Also, it's a, one can think of the lattice not only, there are two advantages to it. One is that it allows you to do these functional integrals. I'll say how in a moment, but it allows you to do them. The second is that it's putting in an ultraviolet regulator of a very different kind. And in particular, it's a regulator that allows you to do to do a non perturbative analysis. Is, is that uh, the cutoffs based on the, the lattice spacing? Now? Yes. And how, it, it seems like I can just make that arbitrarily small here, but how, when does that, like, how? Well, okay, all right. I remember way back, 
It's like 30 years ago when people were first talking about lattice gauge theory. Oh, well, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. It was, I don't know, it depends. I mean, you, different people thought about it at different times in the 70s and even the 60s and even earlier than that. But um, when Kreutz's papers first became uh, famous, the model that he was typically using was 10 lattice spacings in each of the space-time directions. So it was a lattice with 10 to the fourth points. And this was supposed to represent the whole universe. Okay? That's pretty close. Right. So it, it, it was, so there's a certain, to, to some extent, it's, I mean, when you look at it, it's very appealing, but it's also a little bit of so, I mean, I understand it's, it's kind of got the analogy with condensed matter, right? Where you, you it, it makes sense as you're approximating something, right? Yeah, but, you know, in, 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 but, right, right, right. What you can say, of course, is you impose periodic boundary conditions. So with the periodic boundary conditions, you effectively expand space to everywhere. So then, Okay, you so, so I was just going to say, I understand it doesn't make sense to try to see what's going on at a scale less than A, but what sets A physically? Well, what you do is you, you, you see what happens as you let A get smaller and smaller, which is to say, I mean, that, that, that's a great question here. Thanks. What, um, all right, so here's the program of renormalization, okay? You use, you set up your action, you set up your Monte Carlo program so that you compute these things, okay? And you do it, say, with a 10 to the fourth lattice, and you get certain numbers and in, for various things, physical things that you measure, like this, but something that you know, okay? like some mass of some particle, or some coupling constant. And you say, okay, that's what it is on 10 to the fourth. Now we're gonna to go to 20 to the fourth. So if we replace A by A over two. We redo the functional integration. And now, redoing the functional integration, in order to keep the charge and the mass and so forth at their physical values, we need to change the coupling constant, the bare coupling constant. So we had G0 of A, now we have G0 of A over 2. And then in principle, we go to, uh, we have A again. Okay, this is in principle, of course. We have A again, and then we figure out what the value of G0 is so that now we get the right mass and co physical coupling constant and so forth for uh, a lattice spacing A over 4. So in principle then, we can see that if you had enough computer power, you could just work this out. Okay, and you, you then see uh, what you expect. Now, in, in what does that mean? It, it approaches something asymptotically as you make A smaller and smaller? Or, yeah. um, well, it, it, it certainly has to change each time you have, each time you have A, uh, G0 has to change to keep the physical things that you know about correct. Okay. As long as it's, you can, it's finite, you can, is the theory still good? Right, well everything's always finite. Does that make There's no longer? infinities at all here, right? This is a ratio that's, that's... As I make A smaller and smaller, doesn't that change get smaller and smaller as well? All right, let's, let's, think, let's, let's, let, let's think about that. The, the, let, me, let me see what I, I... Let me get the formula right. Um, uh, I unfortunately did not bring those notes in with me. The, all right, let me just do it sort of off the top of my head, but this is going to be harder. Um, 
If we had chosen the other path, in other words, if we had been, if we had done renormalization for non-abelian gauge theories, which was the other topic, what we would have found was that for a typical <coughs> non-abelian gauge theory, there's something called asymptotic freedom. And what this means is that the coupling constant, let us call it g0 squared, that the coupling constant is something like 1 over 1 plus the log of the energy over g0. Okay, it looks kind of like that, where this is um, okay. Let me let me let me try to get this straight. Actually, it's the physical coupling constant. The effective coupling constant at energy E is going down with the energy, which is just, uh, and what is it, first, what does this mean? What this means is, suppose you wanted to approximate the correct cross-section at energy E by doing a tree-level diagram, what coupling constant would you use? Okay. The coupling constant you'd use would be G of E at energy E. Well, what, um, it, when you take into account the loops, what happens? Well, what happens is that you have a 1 plus uh, log of E. It goes down like that. Okay, Th now, now, what does that mean then for our lattice theory? For the lattice theory, it means that um, Let's see. We can think of this then as G0 squared of 1 over A is 1 over 1 plus log of 1 over A and then some A0. Okay, because basically E is 1 over A. So now this is our picture of how things are. So this means that 1 over g squared, and I'm calling this 1 over a, but I could call this g0 of a. Anyway, 1 over g0 squared then is 1 plus log a0 <laughs> over a. And that means then that, um, 1 over g0 squared minus 1 is log of a0 over a. Now we will uh, rewrite that as minus log of a over a0. Now I'm going to exponentiate. And so I get e to the 1 over g0 squared minus 1. This minus 1 is just a scale factor is e to the minus log of this. So this is e to the a0 over a. So I was stupid to do that. I should have just gone like that. OK. So this means then that the lattice spacing a is a0 e to the minus 1 over g0 squared. And let me. Forget about this one, it's just an overall constant. So that means then that as your, and this is g0 of g0 squared of a. Okay. I should call it like it's g of a. Anyway, as a goes to zero then, as a goes to zero, g0 does what? g0 goes to zero. Or to put it differently, as G0, as A goes to zero, that's, we're going to high energy. At high energy, 
we expected over here G to go to zero. But as G goes to zero, you see that this, this, this lattice constant goes to zero like nobody's business. I mean, it really goes to zero super fast. And something like this, this was actually seen in some of Kreutz's early simulations. And when that was seen, then um, uh, Uh, that was in, in, in indi that was taken as an indication that this was really a legitimate um, operation that he that lattice gauge theory. Um, unfortunately, I can't draw you the diagram from um, off the top of my head, but um, let me see if I can just sort of think about it. Um, I think it was basically this, that um, if we're plotting A here, well, that's not how it was done. It was the, uh, all right, I don't remember what the figure looked like, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you next time. Let me, um, what I had planned actually to talk about today was how you actually do this integral in terms of Monte Carlo's. And um, what I think, if we, what I think would be instructive here would be for us to pick certain systems that were simpler than lattice gauge theory and Monte Carlo them and see how see these re, see these renormalization group trajectories for simple field theories, and in fact, what what what's occurred to me is we could maybe do this as sort of a group project or a homework problem. I don't know which you which you prefer. Um, one question would be um, what. Uh, what to simulate? Okay, there, there are you know so many possibilities. Um, this could be an arbitrary problem in statistical physics. It could be something as simple as Z2 gauge theory, or it could be a Heisenberg ferromagnet or some simple spin system on a lattice. It could be the icing model or something more complicated. In any event. Um, but now the trouble is, this stuff, people started doing this back, I don't know, it must have been, I mean, it, it actually started in the 40s, it was an idea largely, to, I'm told it was Fermi's idea, he told Metropolis and Metropolis wrote it up in a paper whose authors were Metropolis, Metropolis, Teller and Teller, I think there were two wives on the paper, that's what actually was happening. Um, what was it? Yeah. What did you say was actually on the thing? I missed the last thing you said. It was Metropolis, Metropolis, Teller, Teller. That was the authors, and I think those were the wives, but I don't know. Could have been children. Um, brothers. Um, I don't know. In any event, it was the Monte Carlo technique, which I was um, about to tell you about. But that started, as I said, back in the 40s. But of course, computers were so inflationally slow then. That not a hell of a lot happened. And then as computers got faster and faster, and then the metropolis method spread, it was used a lot in, 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 uh, in chemistry. And it didn't come back into, well, it was used in statistical physics and chemistry, and then, it, and then Kreutz brought it back into physics. Curiously, Wilson invented this method, but didn't know about, didn't think about using the Monte Carlo, applying the Monte Carlo method to it. Um, it's a little late, I guess, to start the Monte Carlo method. Let me just tell you where it is that you can see the Monte Carlo method if you want to look it up. In the online notes, it's chapter 14. Okay. So, um, and 
Now, this Monte Carlo method is just extremely general. You can use it to approximate integrals. You can use it to an, uh, analyze experiments. And in fact, do you want me to do that in class? Or shall I just jump to its application in field theory? I think jump to the application because, I mean, I think most of us have probably programmed stuff using Monte Carlo in the simulations. Yeah. All right, but the, to tell you the truth, um, the question of its application in experiments. All right, I tell you what, I'll go over it quickly, the application to experiments. And then, all right, just, the, the class is pretty much over. Let me just tell you what the metropolis step is. This is this is the key thing that you you think of you need you need some way to measure the energy. And if you, you imagine a jump from E to E prime and also a jump from E prime to E. Okay. And if if E prime is less than e. You take this. You, you make the change. If e prime is greater than e, you take it with probability e to the minus uh, e prime minus e over kt, or or some other parameter. And that's uh, that. Basically, it. All right. I'll. I'll explain. I'll start next time explaining on the follows, and then um, what would what would be amusing, and you guys can all sort of you know get online and Google something. You know, we could we could possibly simulate something that hasn't been simulated, although it's a little unlikely. Well, I mean, there's so many things you can simulate. Hmm. I don't know. Sounds good. We'll start with the answer. All right. But, um,